for all its beauty, for all its cosmic wonder, space has given humanity no shortage of things to be really scared of. From the possibility that the next planet-killing asteroid, or worse, planet-killing comet, could be right on our doorstep, to the idea of an alien race showing up tomorrow and wiping us all off the map, to a black hole spiraling out of control somewhere in a secretive laboratory, to the prospect of a gamma ray burst that would wipe out all of humanity in the blink of an eye without warning. It is truly nightmare fuel. But the thing about all these disasters, as well as countless others in our universe, is that they occur very infrequently, with the likelihood that any one of us would experience them in our lifetimes being pretty close to nil. Not so, though, for solar flares, a very real, very common event brought on by all the natural boiling and bubbling of stars just like our sun. In fact, our sun has its own history of pelting Earth with solar flares, catching us in unpredictable bursts that spray outward like some sort of intergalactic sneeze. Look, if you're watching this video and are more than a few years old, and we'd hazard a guess that you are, then you've already lived through more than one such flare, and you've got a pretty decent likelihood of living through a big one. So today on Astrographics, we're going to be digging into the cosmic threat of solar flares, exploring why they happen, how they happen, and whether or not they're truly the sort of astral apocalypse that should have us all quaking in our boots. So look, any object in the universe with a center that isn't solid is probably going to have eruptions. Here on planet Earth and on innumerable exoplanets and moons, active plate tectonics lead volcanoes to spew molten lava and ash onto the planet's surface. On icy planets and moons like Enceladus, where an outer shell of ice gives way to a vast undersea ocean, geysers burst forth through the shell and discharge plumes of water vapor into open space. And in the case of stars, whose own cores are a churning, writhing mass of plasma, eruptions come in two forms. Eruptions of the plasma itself and eruptions of electromagnetic radiation. The former phenomenon is called a coronal mass ejection, or CME, which generally involves a whole bunch of plasma being launched into space in waves and wisps that are uh, several times larger than our planet. CMEs often co-occur with solar flares, but they're not quite the same thing, and they can happen independently as well. A solar flare is something of a different beast, though. It's a localized eruption occurring in one part of the sun that launches charged waves across the electromagnetic spectrum, including everything from microwaves to radio waves to infrared, visible, and ultraviolet light to ionized forms of radiation like x-rays. Those waves then reverberate outward into space, losing energy at a consistent and mild enough rate that they can permeate far into the solar system before they stop having a significant impact. When a solar flare occurs, the plasma of the sun is temporarily superheated to a temperature of over 10 million Kelvin in a portion of the sun that stretches through all three layers of the solar atmosphere. Its photosphere, the outer layer that's attached, so to speak, to the contiguous body of plasma below, the chromosphere, where jets of plasma radiate upward in a layer some three to 5,000 kilometers thick, and the corona, the outermost clouds of plasma that sit as an almost cloud-like haze around the rest of the star. The flare, jetting upward through these three layers, accelerates the protons and electrons involved to nearly the speed of light before exploding outward and jetting off into the void. As we said before, these often are accompanied by coronal mass ejections, which have been captured in some truly stunning photographs that provide a good visualization of what's happening in a flare. And often, they take place in regions of the sun that also feature sunspots, temporary dark spots where a strong magnetic field causes the nearby area to cool down substantially. It's this cooling effect that connects the sun's corona to the solar interior, basically opening a hole from which a solar flare can burst forth. Naturally, an event this big is going to have some pretty serious kick to it. At a minimum, most observable solar flares will be produced by an energy burst equal to or greater than about 100 quintillion joules of energy, which is about as much energy as it takes to power the entirety of human civilization on Earth for three months straight. And again, this is just one relatively minor solar flare. The major flare, however, runs well up into the tens or even hundreds of sextillions of energy, while truly serious ones can be even bigger than that. So really, 
really big. Sometimes the directionality of that energy emission can lead to what's called a flare spray, a supercharged bit of plasma traveling at hundreds or even thousands of kilometers per second. On average, a flare can last anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes, while flares that last for half an hour or more have their own classification called long duration events. As for when solar flares happen, the actual dates and incidence rates are as unpredictable as, say, an earthquake is here on Earth. But they get a good bit more predictable when we start to zoom out and chart them along the sun's regular solar cycle. This is a pretty regular phenomenon that the sun exhibits, with the incidence rate of sunspots, CMEs, and electromagnetic activity rising and falling over the course of those 11 years before repeating the cycle again. During peak incidence rates, called the solar maximum, flares can erupt several times per day, while during solar minimum, there might only be two or three a month. Like natural disasters here on Earth, flares get progressively less and less likely as they get bigger, although even the most severe flares happen just barely less than once a year on average. Now, when Discussing solar flares as they relate to planet Earth, it's really important to understand that not every solar flare is inherently risky. In fact, if flares happen on the side of the sun that isn't facing the Earth, then there is no danger at all. That ejection of material will just explode outward in some other direction. So too does the direction of a flare matter even when it's on the side of the sun that we can see. Like any other wave, the electromagnetic radiation that comes off will move like ripples in a pond, but not necessarily with a uniform intensity. That is to say, a solar flare might might be extremely powerful, but if it's headed off in some other direction, it'll just be a glancing blow here on Earth. But then there are the flares that do come our way, and then any questions about impact become about intensity. Scientists who observe solar flares will give them one of three important classifications, X-class, M-class, and C-class. These classifications are exponential, much like the Richter scale measuring earthquakes. So an X-class flare is 10 times more powerful than an M-class, and so on. The most minor a C-class, which are still fairly massive events on the sun, but generally don't come with quite enough force to cause havoc for humans. Then there are the M-class flares, which typically have the most impact in the world's polar areas and go just about unnoticed everywhere else. It's the largest flares, the X-class flares, whose strong X-ray waves can have the biggest impact. Now, for posterity's sake, we've got to mention that B-class and A-class flares also exist, but these are basically negligible effect. As far as actual danger posed by solar flares goes, let's first discuss what they can do. When an X-class flare or a strong M-class flare hits, it distorts the Earth's magnetosphere to the point that electromagnetic phenomena like auroras show up far closer to the equator than usual and geomagnetic storms erupt across the high northern and low southern hemispheres with their greatest intensity at the poles, and the extent of their reach toward the equator is dictated by the strength of a storm. Affected areas can experience total electrical blackouts, a collapse in high-frequency radio communications, and far too much interference for satellite signals to break through. In space, astronauts, satellites, and spacecraft are at particular risk, with any humans in orbit being forced to shelter and weather the storm, while radiation-sensitive satellites must be powered down to prevent system failure. In the most extreme cases, blackouts can occur on Earth's entire sunlit side. And while these events are relatively rare, they'll occur several times during the average human lifetime. Now, these effects have the capacity to do a good deal of material damage to Earth's technologies and infrastructure. Transformers in unprotected air areas or without the right protections can be knocked offline and even severely damaged, while satellites that aren't properly prepped for an incoming flare can be put out of commission potentially permanently. In developed countries, these sorts of effects could lead to prolonged blackouts in rural areas, significant repair costs, and telecoms disruption for a somewhat greater length of time, plus a potential for accidents aboard planes whose navigational systems are disrupted. For developing areas, the consequences could be a good deal worse, with less protected power infrastructure collapsing at larger scales. For countries like South Africa and India, already worried about rising energy crises, damage on this scale could have a major knock-on effect, up to and including the collapse of their entire energy grid. At that point, the potential for larger scale suffering via clean water shortages, civil unrest during blackouts, and more becomes a good bit more real. But we've also got to understand what solar flares 
can't do. Unlike electromagnetic pulses or EMPs that take place much closer to the Earth's surface inside the confines of our atmosphere, solar flares would have to be incredibly powerful in order to damage computers, phones, televisions, in-home electrical wiring, outdoor power lines, cars, or aircraft. And while a solar flare that strong isn't technically impossible, it would be far beyond the scale of anything we've seen the sun do during the decades its activity has been monitored. And we're going to go out on a limb and assume that somebody probably would have noticed by now if these flares produced mass casualty events here on Earth like a cyclone or a tsunami would. Instead, the surface of the planet is protected by Earth's atmosphere, which is insulating enough that even the biggest historical flares in history have made no appreciable impact on the well-being of humans or other terrestrial beings. In fact, for the vast majority of human history, people had absolutely nothing to fear from solar flares. They were just another cosmic phenomenon that we largely didn't know about and had never been impacted by. So, it's important not to discount the damage that solar flares are capable of causing, but much to the chagrin of some rather sensationalist headline writers, it's also important not to blow them out of proportion. A solar flare is not going to cause apocalyptic death and destruction, it's not going to cause a full breakdown of the world's electrical grid, and it's not going to send a planet's worth of satellites plummeting and burning up in the atmosphere. They're very common phenomena, and while the potential for large-scale flares to have an impact has increased proportionally to humanity's reliance on digital systems, the worst-case scenario isn't nearly as devastating as some sources might have you believe. Technically speaking, it is possible for much larger events to take place. Tree rings around the world show evidence of massive radiation spikes, referred to as Miyake events, a few times each millennium. But the likelihood of those gargantuan flares going off at a given time is nowhere near high enough to spend time worrying about. And yes, I'll take the liberty of knocking on wood right now. Now, as this was being written, we're coming up to the end of the summer of 2023. But we're also coming up towards something else. Solar Maximum, which is expected to occur in 2025. During Solar Maximum, the intensity and frequency of solar flares both increase substantially, meaning that the likelihood of a major event also rises. In the past, Solar Maximum has seen Earth experience dozens of medium-sized flares and quite a few larger ones, and given that the upcoming Solar Maximum will come at a time when humans are more dependent on satellite technology and electricity than ever, there's been increased public attention on the threat of flares over the last few years. All around the world, solar flare experts monitor the sun constantly for signs of upheaval. Sunspots, minor flares, and coronal mass ejections are all tracked and measured in order to try and get a read on when the next flare will take place. It's difficult to give any kind of advanced warning when a flare does happen. After all, the electromagnetic pulse it generates will hit Earth in about eight minutes, the same amount of time that it takes light from the sun to reach us. But generally, the most worrying flares are telegraphed pretty well. There's quite a long latency period between the time when the flare itself would wash over Earth and when the remnants of a coronal mass ejection would arrive as long as a couple of days later. All these warning signs give scientists and satellite operators plenty of time to batten down the hatches in anticipation of a major event, and during solar maximum, a known time of high activity, the relevant personnel around the world have all the more reason to stay ready. As for what a truly impactful solar flare might look like in reality, history contains a few clues. The largest solar flare that humans have witnessed after industrialization came in September 1859 in an eruption known as the Carrington event. So named, it was named after an amateur astronomer, Richard Carrington, who recorded it in England as it happened. Prior to this event, global amateurs had observed an increased number of sunspots for a few weeks, but it was Carrington who happened to be looking up at the sun when the flare hit. According to his notes, Carrington initially experienced a blinding flash of white light that persisted for some five minutes before abating. This was the initial solar flare hitting Earth just a few minutes after it happened on the sun. The following day, telegraph systems experienced severe disruptions, and their operators received significant electrical shocks and had fires set in their offices from the sparking machines setting pieces of paper alight. Auroras became visible in tropical latitudes where they're almost never seen. Honolulu, Hawaii, Kingston, Jamaica, and Santiago, Chile, among other places. For the following days, auroral currents became the only way to transmit information via telegraph as the lines wouldn't operate with any other energy source. According to some analysts, an event of that size would have crashed the internet if it happened today, bringing the online world to its knees for 
who knows how long and resulting in multiple trillions of dollars in damages. A somewhat more modern day example came in March of 1989 when astronomers observed a solar flare of class X15, basically a really bloody big one. In this case, the flare caused major disruptions to the United States power grid, but its biggest effects came in the Canadian province of Quebec, where geological features underground prevented the flare's electromagnetic current from dissipating through the earth. For nine hours, the entire region went offline, and though the utilities in Quebec could be brought back online, in that case, the impact was severe enough that the Toronto Stock Exchange completely stopped trading when another, more minor solar flare was observed a few months later. In this event, auroras were visible all throughout the continental United States, with disruptions significant enough to cause public concern that a nuclear first strike from the Soviet Union might be underway. Luckily, it wasn't, and the world was able to come back online within a few days. Then there were the Halloween solar storms which hit Earth in 2003, which hit anywhere between an X-28 and an X-45 on flare impact scales, so, well, way bigger than the 1989 flares, but still far smaller than the Carrington event. Although the impact of these particular flares was concentrated with an impact mostly near the Earth's poles, it led to power disruptions in Sweden and South Africa and sent auroras down to the Mediterranean Sea. GPS systems were seriously disrupted, so too were airline flights over the North Pole, and Antarctic research stations experienced prolonged communications blackouts. Typically, this event took place several years after the conclusion of Solar Maximum in the year 2000. But it was an indicator that all things considered, the Earth was somewhat ready to deal with a flare of that size. Far from being the sort of event that caused global pandemonium, it caused little more than a blip in most people's days, suggesting that even a really major flare might not lead to the sort of widespread damage that many onlookers fear. All things considered, it wouldn't be quite right to declare solar flares a non-issue entirely, though. Their impact does, no doubt, have the potential to mess with global infrastructure, and it remains to be seen how humans would respond to a truly extreme flare in the 21st century. But the conception of a solar flare as a truly earth-shaking natural disaster, well, it really doesn't hold up, until and unless humans are faced with the sort of flare that only occurs a few times every thousand years. So long as those flares don't materialize, and again, it's safe to say that this sort of solar activity will brush past planet Earth just fine.